let's start things start things out. Um, my name is uh, Adam Tooze. Uh, I'm the director of the European Institute at Columbia, and um, it's my pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event this evening for the book launch of A Perfect Fascist, A Story of Love, Power and Morality in Mussolini's Italy, which was just published by Harvard uh, University Press. It's a particular pleasure to start this fall semester with this wonderful book by Victoria de Grazia. Um, Perfect Fascist tells the story of Attilo Taruzzi, an Italian army officer who became a commander of the Black Shirts and a colonial administrator under Mussolini. The book analyzes through Taruzzi's career and personal history the inner workings of Italian fascism. It also explores the issues of ultranationalism, strong men, and racial conflict, which, as we know, remain sadly relevant in today's political discourse. And it's a huge pleasure to welcome Vicky. Uh, former director, of course, my predecessor, uh, director of the European Institute, one of the pillars, really, of this institute and its history. Uh, this evening, along with three panelists, Rachel uh, Donadio, Susan Peterson, and Alexander Stiller, who've agreed to discuss this book. Victoria de Grazia is the Moore Collegiate Professor of History at Columbia. She works on the history of Italy, Europe, and transatlantic relations. Her prize-winning books include Irresistible Empire, America's advance through 20th century Europe and how fascism ruled women, Italy, 1922 to 1945, a book I was particularly reminded of in encountering her new work. The common thread of Victoria's research has been her focus on power. As she explained in Irresistible Empire, she writes on power and its two faces, consent and force, persuasion and violence, the movement from one to the other, the thin line between them. And Perfect Fascism, The Perfect Fascist, the new book, continues to explore these themes, um, but it's also the first biography that Vicky's written. And she tells us, it, she will tell us in her opening remarks what led her to Attila Turuzzi in this remarkable story. To discuss Victoria's book, we have a really wonderful panel. We're fortunate to have with us Rachel Donadio, contributing writer at The Atlantic where Rachel covers politics and culture across Europe with a focus on populism, migration, feminism, and the history of ideas. She's also a visiting lecturer in the Humanities Council and Ferris Professor of Journalism at Princeton University this fall. Rachel previously served as European culture correspondent, the Rome bureau chief of the New York Times, and as a writer and editor at the Times Book Review. She's now based in Paris, and we're very grateful to her for joining us this evening from Paris at such a late hour for her, it's one of the great miracles of Zoom that we can do this kind of thing, but it does require people to be very flexible when it comes to time difference. We're also privileged to welcome Susan Pedersen, who is the Governor Morris Professor of History at Columbia University. Susan specializes in British history, the British Empire, comparative European history and international history. She's the author of many books, including The Guardians, The League of Nations and The Crisis of Empire, and a uh, biography, Eleanor Rathbone and The Politics of Conscience. And I can't help but notice that as a British Member of Parliament and campaigner, Eleanor Rathbone stood on every possible issue at the exact opposite end of the political spectrum from Taruzzi. I'm looking forward very much to hearing Susan's comments, both on the substance of the history of fascism, but also on the basis, on the project, on the business of writing biography. And it's a great pleasure also to have on our panel Alexander Stiller, San Paolo Professor of International Journalism at the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University, Alexander has worked as a contributor to numerous publications, including the New York Times, La Repubblica, the New Yorker magazine, the New York Review of Books, The Atlantic, The New Republic. It's a remarkable CV. He's the author of numerous books, including Benevolence and Betrayal, Excellent Cadavers, The Future of the Past, The Sack of Rome, and The Force of Things. The story of two families in Europe and America, which also offers an interesting contrast with the story of Attila Taruzzi and Liliana Weinman, who are at the center of Vicky's narrative. So thank you to Victoria, Rachel, Susan and Alexander for being with us this evening. I would also like to thank a long list of co-sponsors for this evening's event, the European Institute of course and the team there, Francois Carol Biard and Sharon Kim who have made this possible, the Department of History, the Department of Italian, the Italian Academy of Advanced Studies in America and the Society of Fellows and the Heyman Center for the Humanities all areas in which Vicky, over her long and glorious tenure at Columbia, has had a huge influence. 
And we'd also like to thank Book Culture, which has helped us spread the word about this event and has helped us draw in this wonderful crowd this evening. Uh, and he's also offering a 10% discount for purchases of The Perfect Fascist. So please support your local bookstore and cash in on this discount by using the promo code CU Europe when ordering the books online to claim the discount. This is a Zoom event. All sorts of things can go right, all sorts of things can go wrong. We're all familiar with the, 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 the pitfalls of this medium. Um, please uh, do your best to remain muted throughout the event. Um, if you would like to ask questions, and we will have a zone for that at the end, please um, write those into the chat function. You can see the chat button on the bottom of your screen. Activate that, type it in, and I'll do my best to scan those. I can't promise to ask every single question, but that is by far and away the most efficient way of dealing with Q&A in a large audience setting like this. So we will start with a short presentation of the book by Vicky herself. Then we will have a series of comments, starting with Alexander Stiller, then Susan Pedersen and Rachel Denardio in that order will make their comments. We'll then go have a back and forth on our virtual panel. And then in the last half hour, I hope to open things up. We'll finish punctually uh, at 7.30. So please note before we start that this event is being recorded and the video will be posted online to a YouTube channel of the European Institute uh, and the channels of our sponsors. So just so you know, we are, we are being recorded. And it's now my pleasure to give the floor to, to Vicky. We did want to start uh, with a short uh, documentary film, a fascist documentary film, to show you how the fascists, this is in 1933, a specific moment uh, viewed the inner circle, viewed the inner circle of the old guard. And in this, you will have your first opportunity to, to look for uh, the perfect fascist, the man I call the perfect fascist, uh, Attilio Teruzzi. So, uh, Sharon, you're going to start this a couple minutes long. It's the militia, 10th anniversary. Uh, here goes. Maria. 
Tarasia Kille. Taruzia Tilio. So what we saw there was an unusual uh, look at these men together. And what my sense was is, hey, these are just, just men. Some looking anxious, little jokey, pitting medals on one another, cocooned in immense power. And this, in some ways, lies behind my interest uh, in this man, who, by the time we finish, I hope you will understand as a perfect fascist, but also a very imperfect fascist, and probably even a more troubled and flawed human being. So what I want to do briefly is speak to this man, OK? He is born the same year as Mussolini, 1882, with a similar background. Father, a small shopkeeper, wine, mother, better educated from a higher status. Uh, Milan, poor, okay? probably very impetuous, probably got in trouble during the 1899 uh, revolts, uh, worker revolts, uh, 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 which brought in the army. He went into the army. Uh, as a colonial soldier, which would be the equivalent of joining the Foreign Legion. And here we have him. His first 20 years, he is a good soldier. He, Eritrea, Italian Eritrea, uh, head of Ascari troops, uh, mercenaries hired by the Italians uh, to fight their colonial wars, by smarts, which probably is just in terms of you know, having good arithmetic skills. He makes it in uh, to the Academy of Modena, but he had to be recommended. And he is a, a, a lieutenant in the Asprey troops when Italy invades uh, Tripolitania, uh, Cyrenaica during the, the Ottoman, the Turkish, uh, excuse me, the Italian Ottoman War of 1911. We then want to just move on here very quickly to get this background. Here he is, uh, the phot photographer of the Arrivista of Milan, an officer and a gentleman, 1913. Uh, here he is, at now advancing, a captain in World War I, also aide-de-camp uh, of a very important general, Bacardi, uh, and he who names him or has him promoted to battalion major, and he goes to Derna. And that is the extent of his military career up to that point. It's a slow career, there must be some little flaw, but he is regarded as the utter the soul of loyalty and utter courage. He would take a bullet for uh, his uh, captain. He did that already at Maharuga, and uh, also for his general. Okay. Uh, 25 years in. At his return, almost immediately, he joins the fascists. And we can come back to that. He meets Mussolini. He joins the fascists. He's an organizer of squads. He, the, the qualities of major are very useful for organizing the squads. And uh, even though he's uh, a zealot, but not very ideological, uh, he is appointed to be vice president of the, one of the vice presidents of the fascist party in charge of liaising, so keeping his major functions. And then on, here he is, right in the middle, okay, posing like a fifth man. He's not one of the four quadrumvirs, but he has le led a legion, uh, uh, one of the 13 legions, which make the march on Rome. And then we begin to see some leaps and bounds, which is very interesting. He's a deputy to parliament from 1924 all the way to 39, but 24 is an important movement moment uh, when fascists enter into parliamentary life in order to destroy it. He's also appointed undersecretary at the Home Ministry, which means he's good at policing and obeying orders, where he stays from 
25 to 26. Here you can see him now in a very new role as a statesman next to, in, in the midst of Mussolini's cabinet, uh, celebrating the, um, uh, uh, the Memorial Day on November 4th for the First World uh, War Dead. And here he is, he's appointed governor of Saranaica in 20, uh, 1926, the first fascist civilian government. He stays there for two years, and it's said he does well. He comes back, he's appointed to be head of the fascist militia, 350,000 men, okay, which were the, the, trans, the, the squadristi transformed into a voluntary militia, uh, militia reporting to Mussolini and therefore in conflict competition often uh, with the uh, established uh, military with the army. Uh, here he is in some ways aide de camp to Mussolini. This was his old general during World War I. Uh, maneuvers. And then he goes on. Now he becomes a general in the field. He's promoted. Uh, he's, he, takes, he takes charge of the only militia division, uh, which is uh, headed by a, a, an old guard fascist uh, in the Ethiopian War. He's there for two years. They mainly build roads, but nonetheless, uh, he gets many more medals. But he's also then appointed by Mussolini personally to be the general inspector after the fascists have been defeated at Guadalajara to check out, clean up the fascist secret expeditionary force to Spain in 1937. Here we can see him. Battle of, uh, of, of uh, 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 Santander, excuse me, uh, August 1937, here uh, with uh, 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 Franco, uh, with General Franco. Okay. And then on. Now we're heading toward the end here. He has risen all the way to become the Minister of Italian Africa, 1939 to 1943, at which point he's also become a division general and retired. So he's also made now a military career for himself politically. Okay. Here we've moved on, fascism falls, and he's a re retired hierarch, okay, living close by Mussolini, uh, whom he defended until the end. He wasn't on the Grand Council, but another, nonetheless, we know that he did support him, where he will be under occupied uh, uh, territory, uh, occupied by the German forces. And finally, we see him purged hierarch from 1945 to 1950, where he becomes the chief assistant librarian to the prison chaplain in the penitentiary. So what, nothing had been written about Traduzzi. Not that that would be in any way a reason to write about this man, because when I did go and look, at, when I became somewhat interested, it was generally agreed that he was in some ways a nobody or perhaps even something worse uh, to the historians whom I asked. For example, they trotted out the remarks of Costanzo, uh, excuse me, Galeazzo Ciano, uh, Mussolini's son-in-law, who was at that time uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. His diaries are widely read, uh, and you can look this up, and who said, commented at the latest promotion of Teruzzi, he's mediocre but loyal. Uh, maybe he's more loyal than mediocre. And uh, Professor Rochat, brilliant historian of the military in Italy, when I asked him about it, he said, oh yeah, nothing. He's a nothing, the rutting bull of the empire. So the question would be, well, why would I care? And indeed my feminist Columbia reading group often was worried about why I was so persistent. And the question here is, of course, why would you? And it's true, if I were pursuing a tried and, tr uh, and true historical problematic, my thoughts would not turn to Teruzzi. Uh, Adam cordially pointed out that I've always been interested in power. You'd have to go perhaps to either a large family uh, with a lot of ruckus or some sort of deep psychoanalytic thing. I'm interested in pecking orders. I'm interested in circuits of power, resistance and heresy, how you get around uh, being killed when you, when, 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 the, the, what Foucault calls the conduct of conduct. There's a whole range between macro and micro. And indeed, in the 1990s, in the early 2000s, when I was, had finished this previous book on this expanded American power, I was curious about the new strongmen appearing in the 1990s uh, in Russia, uh, 
in, in the United States, if you could call Ross Perot that, and most singly in Italy, because they seem so uh, fragile. And it was so interesting to me how they could coon themselves in power, and especially how they had to have wives or some, sort of sort of retinue in order to make them feel, uh, give them a kind of security. However, I probably would not have pursued this because it, it you know, studying Berlusconi, fortunately, Alexander Stillo was dedicating himself to, a, to, to a, a, a putting a stake through the heart of Berlusconi, which freed up uh, others of us. But I was in this case, rather than pursuing a tried and true historical problematic, which is my normal mode for proceeding, I was captured by serendipity. And serendipity was that I was brought a woman's archive the archive of Liliana Weinman Terruzzi, uh, brought to me by a, a New York uh, woman, Upper West Side, who was an amateur historian, who knew I was an historian, went through her, her son and daughter-in-law. Uh, and she uh, brought to me, thought I might be interested, lest they'd be thrown away, about four bags and boxes. It ultimately ended up about seven linear feet when it was sorted out of papers. Okay, now I would normally be caught up that by that. She was very interested in why this, you know, daughter, this talented daughter Liliana Weinman, uh, who was then 26 after four years of working like crazy to become an opera uh, uh, diva, uh, you know, an opera singer, a soprano, working with the very best in Italy. Why she would have married an old bearded fascist? Something happened to be 17 years or older, and the beard which she found pr particularly. Uh, um, a loathsome, uh, that was particularly loathsome in the family. So again, that was a question, well, that interested me very modestly, but when I did look into the bags, this is what I found. Well, first of all, a whole cart full of glorious photographs and clippings and other things, letters, which documented this extraordinary career that this young woman was making uh, in Milan, which was the place to go to study uh, after World uh, War I. Toscanini had completely redone the Met, uh, excuse me, the Met, he had completely redone uh, La Scala as he went to the Met. His successor, um, Serafine, took her under uh, hand before he also followed Toscanini to go to the Met. Uh, and you know, brilliant career, it seemed, and they tested to in these photographs, certainly gorgeous. Uh, and then there was a whole other set, which left me very interested and very perplexed. Maybe a hundred small photographs from the governorate of Saranaica, which showed Italians on campaign, sort of photograph by photograph, camels, uh, various kinds of uh, mercenary forces, and one like this, this is the Oasis of Giallo, uh, February 1928, uh, where we can see this figure, Teruzzi, in this black leather, it's very cold, with, with an interpreter uh, subjecting the sh sh sheikhs, uh, the tribal leaders and Sanusi leaders, uh, to the authority of the Italians, which was uh, what they were constantly trying to do. Okay. And I was very interested in that, especially the idea of this American woman who is uh, somehow connected to uh, this colonial warfare. And finally, last but not least, separation and annulment records that went from 1929, separation, civil uh, suit, uh, to 1947. These were several volumes, and they are secret documents to the extent that the trials are secret. Most of the trial records are written in Latin, in church Latin. They're legal documents, and there was a whole set of them which showed that there was an effort that then lasted over, what, but, you know, 17 years or more, uh, 15 years to, um, uh, to annul uh, the, the marriage between these two uh, people. So there I was saying to myself, hmm, what happened here? I'm not very interested in this woman, though I think she is much more interesting and no question much more intelligent, uh, and most people thought that, but I am interested in this man. So, you know, I'm tur like turning, uh, you know, Simone de Beauvoir uh, on her head, you know, a, a woman is, is, is not born, she's made. I said, hmm, a, fashion, uh, a, a man is not uh, born, he's made. That's consistent now with gender history. And here also to say a fascist is not born, uh, he is made. So the big question that I started on was why this man in 1925, okay, uh, 
mar wanted to marry this woman, why they fell in love, why they were married, again, with and, and to become a happy power couple. She wanted him to go into what she called Mussolini's inner circle. She had a very New York immigrant up notion of upward mobility, why Mussolini was the best man at this wedding, what it, significant, it sig signified, excuse me, that it was a double wedding, civil and church, even though she was Jewish and he was an anti-clerical uh, in 1926. So that was the sort of the first kind of question. Why did he marry her? What did it mean for him and his career? Now, this has meant then that I took a marriage as a springboard to study love, power, and morality in Mussolini's Italy. I would not have probably have thought of that as my at, on its own. If I had, I might have done you know a very small case study, a kind of micro history. There's some very smart you know, studies of marriage for showing power in the Middle Ages and other moments. Uh, but what I did then is said, say, look, let's take this marriage as a jumping off point, okay, um, and begin to think uh, about this whole regime. Why in Italy, this would, fascist Italy, this marriage would have particular connotations? Well, it wasn't obvious at first, but first of all, uh, because this couple thought that they were celebrities, and when they broke up, they told everybody, and they told everybody his story, which she had been unfaithful to her manager and her story that she uh, had been a virgin when they married and uh, it must be a plot, a Yago type plot uh, organized by uh, his, uh, his, his, his people. The fascists too were obsessed with virility, with population problems, with race class, and therefore they worried about the family and Mussolini was very interested in having his men settle down to ingratiate himself with the bourgeoisie, that they not be, you know, libertines and thugs and so on. Okay, the uh, bourgeois family was itself very integrated into the uh, 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 elite leaders of the regime in the 1920s, only to be sort of pushed out in the 1930s when the regime became more and more this bureaucratic apparatus of maildom and there was no longer the salotto. And then finally, their important theor theological uh, and political considerations. The 1930s was the moment when the Catholic Church reassesses its views on marriage the first time since the Council of Trent and originates this gender uh, attack on gender ideology, which comes right down to us today. So it looks like Teruzzi married to protect himself. Uh, uh, his uh, men undermined that trust when he shifted jobs to the head, the militia, uh, and then thereafter, uh, he, he was in some ways disarmed uh, because he did not have a wife to protect him. He continued looking for a similar kind of woman. He finds another strong, intelligent, cosmopolitan foreign woman who is also Jewish and has a child by her. Uh, and you can imagine that after 1938, he finds himself in difficulty, not intermittently, he is married to a Jewish woman whom he can't divorce, and he can't marry then uh, the Jewish woman whom he loves and by whom he has a child. The basis then of quite a drama. Now, uh, just moving on, I think that I wanted to briefly allude to what the, the study of love, power, and morality in Mussolini's Italy. Okay, uh, love. Okay, I noticed in my index on love that it's incredibly long because it was a constant, I had a constant sense that there was so much talk about love. Uh, Robert Paxson argues in his uh, work on, uh, uh, on fascism that what he captured was the most typical dimension of fascism was its emotional life. It's enormous. It's, only, it's hard even to sort of categorize it, but emotion was like everywhere. It was always being played on. Uh, the talk of the revolution, you saw all the emotion, uh, big emotions and little emotions in that little film. Well, in the entry, love then gets bound up with emotion. Uh, we have a, a love among comrades between Jews and Gentiles as coup de foudre, as Eros and Thanatos, 
for family, free love, for Italy, Liliani's idea, Mussolini's idea, Mussolini's, uh, uh, Teruzzi's idea, that's not that many, but also sexual conduct. So we've got love becomes an extremely distorted kind of feeling uh, with efforts to kind of align it to the, the patria, to the, na to the nation, but it's always slipping out. And a figure like Teruzzi, who is very duty bound, who is very awkward, he marries very late, uh, very harsh family life when he was young, uh, the, the, the tumult around love, where he should put it, is an enormous uh, uh, one. Here, uh, one would say unadulterated love for his child, but that brought its own problems because the, his, his, the, her mother was Jewish, that made her Jewish after the race laws, and having to choose between the daughter and the consort, uh, you can imagine that there were problems. Okay. The other question was power. Now, I don't have an index thing on power because uh, it's everywhere. There's macro power where Italy will be becoming greater uh, in the world, which Mussolini is pressing from the get-go. There are all those little micro powers in a Foucault sense, you know, the conduct of conduct, which is very important. What I want to emphasize here is once more the sort of difficulties between understanding power as hierarchy in the military way, and then understanding where that hierarchy will lead. Teruzzi's case, because he is a soldier, he has a very clear idea of hierarchy, and that gives him a big gift going into the fascist regime. He knows who to obey. Mussolini is his commanding officer. He doesn't have a doubt from when he meets him, even if he doesn't have stars and stripes on his shoulder. He is his general. Okay? Uh, then how uh, he's trained, he's trained in military violence and he knows how to use it and he knows who to trust, again, following orders. So that's very, very important. He's got a little problem that he's impetuous and so his violence gets out of control sometimes and is therefore illegal. He beats up people, throws a servant down the stairs who he had had for 20 years. He treats his women when they get out of order, his idea of hierarchy, very, very uh, uh, terribly. But for me, the most important problem in this notion of hierarchy is that it accepts the power uh, of military as being taught. It accepts uh, the, uh, the countries which is most uh, con concretizes that power uh, as the highest. Uh, it also very obsequious in terms of rank and loyalty, and this makes him embrace the Nazi Germany more than others. In other words, trust it more as part of the alliance. They are our allies, they are our brothers, and this will be very influential kind of thinking, which leads people to trust Germany, not just down to 1943, but even to pull little tiny rump republic out of uh, out, out of the, the end game in 1945 because Hitler has this superior thing, not a Priapus, but the secret weapon. And you can see this in the kind of Teruzzi's outlook now on power, where, where it ends up. And finally, we have the not inconsiderable problem of morality. Historians don't deal with morality, though I think we should, and I wanted to call this a moral history, but then, uh, you know, like a social history, but it was going to get me into too much trouble, and I had such a hard time. So rather, there's a question of moral comp compass, nothing more complicated. Okay, this is a uh, Mussolini had very clear idea of the Machiavellian tradition, not perhaps as Machiavelli understood it, but you know, the, the politician is half man, half centaur, you know, his animal instinct was everything, and that was very respected by his men. He got it, he got it again and again and again until he didn't get it, and that was really, really bad by the late 1930s. Uh, Mussolini um, then was absolutely, you know, adored for this dimension, the morality, but there are other moralities. There was a chivalric tradition of the militia. There was a gallant man notion of the army. And indeed, you find that Truzzi would never tell a big lie. That was not his forte. He told little lies. Okay? And he was very, very gifted because of his reserve and his sympathy on the big cover-up, like the Machiotti murder, or the fact that Italy would lose its empire if it went to war on the side of Germany in June 1940. Okay. He was as also a libertine. And you, know, you might say, hey, that's not a bad idea in a Catholic country. Uh, but he was also a cheat, a cad, 
patron of young people, very, very good, but clearly sex was involved, at least for the women uh, in Italy, and who knows, maybe for the men in the colonies. Okay? Rarely you know, curbed by Mussolini, who tried to keep him in line. We see her too of popular morality at work, and that's often overlooked, the policy denunciations, um, uh, because there was no space, if you want. There's plenty of public space, but it's all contorted and secretive. I don't believe that there was no pop uh, public space. Uh, and in secrets and rumors, in sort of contemporary Q anon type thinking, uh, which would turn eventually against Teruzzi when the regime is beginning uh, to collapse because all of a sudden his uselessness becomes apparent and more and more there is this denunciation of his lechery. Uh, vampire of the empire was the way that he ended up being uh, called uh, by a, a leading fascist, a former comrade who had to be the most violent person uh, amongst all of the fascists who is now denouncing him uh, for uh, his womanizing and corruption. So where are we left here? Okay, because you know, I'm giving you a portrait of a man, but really, I, rather than a biography, I think we want to call it a social history of an individual in his context, you know, sort of a group portrait of Teruzzi, surrounded by his women, surrounded by his cronies, surrounded by his clientele, with uh, standing always if you want, at Mussolini's shoulder uh, in a protective type, uh, way, as if to catch the bullet for him. At the moment, we're debating so much what fascism is. Uh, that wasn't the case when I started this book. Um, I think here, giving fascism a human face, a perfect fascist, uh, to show the fascist normal, so to speak, uh, what it destroys, and then how eventually, very late, 20 years, it is destroyed to show this little man operating cocooned by power when he would not have been a major. He would have been maybe an administrator at the Milan Fair if there hadn't been the fascist regime. I think it's important. Um, I think writing a new history of fascism uh, is important. Uh, we tend to more and more be very abstract about what the fascist regime was like, how it held power. We tend uh, uh, Maybe especially to, to like conceptualizations of fascism as totalitarianism, which would suggest the oneness and everybody absorbed into the oneness of Mussolini, there being no heart uh, to uh, crib uh, uh, from, from uh, Hannah Arendt. And by looking and uh, reading this book, I think we'll get, get all of the resonances, uh, all of the events, the occasions, uh, what happens when a country, Italy, um, succumbs to despotism? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Vicky, for that wonderful introduction. Um, can I uh, call on Sandro to um, unmute and uncover his video and um, start the round of Comments, I can't wait. It's, uh, I read the preface and uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic, uh, fantastic argument that Vicky's exploring here and uh, a brilliant introduction we just had. Sandra, are you out there? Yes, I'm here. Excellent. Uh, um, off to, over to you. Are we okay, very good. Well, first, I um, want to say things that, uh, can you hear me? Um, that Vicky perhaps wouldn't say uh, out of modesty. Um, I think it's important to stress this is really a masterful uh, work of historical writing, um, the achievement of a lifetime. And you, what is um, maybe one of the things that's uh, remarkable about it is that you don't, um, you don't feel that because it's extremely readable. It is a book I read with great pleasure even though I was beginning the semester with a lot of uh, uh, prep work to be done, I found myself staying up late in bed, um, devouring the latest chapter to find out how the drama of uh, Attilio and Liliana would work itself out and um, uh, so forth. Um, it is, uh, she manages to blend together um, 
a very readable narrative with lightness and humor, but that can be deceptive because there's enormous scholarly density and a lifetime of work that goes um, into this book that you can feel if you, um, as those of us who have worked a bit in this field, um, know you can, um, you can feel um, the uh, decades of knowledge and work that she has built up over her um, career that is operating in the sentences and the lines of the book. Um, I sometimes think of, you know, if you, if you buy a rug, um, a very high quality rug is one with lots of knots per inches. And in this case, you can feel a lot of knots per inches in these pages, the, the research um, that went behind getting each little detail, um, which is um, uh, really wonderful. I mean, we get these wonderful pieces of granular detail of you know, what they ate at the wedding banquet of, um, uh, the, of the happy couple and uh, all of this sort of um, detail, which makes the book really, really wonderful. But also she has that experience as a story and she knows how to, um, um, uh, to place uh, Teruzzi in, um, um, to place Teruzzi in the institutions that he passes through. So we also understand the significance along with it being an extremely uh, gripping story. Um, the, you know, part of the value uh, when Vicky was uh, was asking the question, why do a book on this? Um, to me, that's a very, very easy answer because it, it takes us into the private life and the marital life of fascism in a way that no other book that I'm familiar with uh, does. And I think that's um, incredibly uh, valuable. Um, it takes us inside of a fascist marriage. Uh, it forces us to think about what masculinity and marriage meant in fascism. I was always very puzzled by, uh, for example, in the um, Futurist Manifesto, which in some way anticipates aspects of fascist culture. One of the most puzzling lines in the, in the uh, Futurist Manifesto is, he talks about uh, Marinetti, uh, about the glories of war and all sorts of things. Then he says, contempt for women, which is very strange. How does this contempt for women fit into this cultural project of a kind of violent modernization, uh, which Marinetti is setting forth and that in many ways, a Mussolini and people like Teruzzi advance. At the same time, as Vicky makes clear, the contempt for women and the assertion of a libertine Virility goes hand in hand with a strange prudish obsession with bourgeois respectability. Mussolini, who himself um, uh, le legitimates his, um, his marriage, gets married in church, is pressuring some of his leaders like Teruzzi to fall into line and do the same. And the other thing, and here I would throw this out as a, a question for, uh, for Vicky, one of the puzzling things is that, as um, she explains, there's this sudden moment in their marriage when um, Teruzzi turns on his wife, Liliana. She's in the States um, um, uh, doing things and, and clearly very much part of this common project of theirs. And then he suddenly just drops her like a stone. And um, there's a whole episode which Vicky excavates in which um, some unscrupulous uh, scallywag gives a set of letters that Liliana wrote to her, uh, her manager, which are used as proof of um, an illicit relationship. But it's not clear why it is that Teruzzi from seemingly from one moment to the other turns on her and decides that she's suddenly a liability to, um, uh, to him. Uh, and so I'm curious to uh, know her uh, thoughts on that because it's, it's, it's very strange and very violent. Um, 
equally um, strange and violent is the moment in his second big relationship with uh, the mother of his child, where he actually has her sent to Lipari, which is uh, you know a, a, an Italian concentration camp, and he's uh, quite um, violent in the persecution of this woman. A last thought, and then I'll, I'll leave it, which I think is an extremely interesting strand to the book, and a thing that makes it a very interesting uh, contribution to history, is the role of the Vatican and the church in this annulment process. As I was reading it, I, I thought, okay, we're sort of now entering into David Kurtzer territory, the relationship between fascism and the Vatican, and I was expecting that the Vatican would fall into line and allow the annulment of this very prominent, powerful uh, fascist leader. They granted annulments of you know various kinds. Why not in this case? Besides, the woman is a Jew to boot uh, and a foreigner, so why not? And yet the church um, holds fast and refuses to give up its terrain on the question of marriage. Um, and then as the story advances and their, uh, the trial goes through the annulment process, um, as Italy, uh, they actually try to use anti-Semitism to win their case. Meanwhile, Mussolini is moving closer to Hitler. You'd think that things are looking worse and worse for Liliana's position in the annulment thing, and yet the church holds fast and never gives in. That is a very, really interesting, um, in light of, the very complicated uh, ballet that's going on between the Vatican and um, the Quirinal um, in this period, it's a very interesting um, sort of data point and um, you know piece of the mosaic. So I'll I'll end there. But those are just um, uh, some thoughts, and and uh, others can pick up on it if they care to. Thank you very much, Sanjo. Susan, would you like to, to come in? Sure. Um, you can hear me, yes? Okay. Uh, so some of what I'll say, I think, just kind of recapitulates things that Alexander Stilla said. Um, but first, I also want to congratulate Vicky, my wonderful colleague, on bringing out this wonderful book in the midst of an interconnected economic and, and health crisis. It was odd reading it at this moment because if you're like me, it's really hard to concentrate right now. And even more because reading this kept me thinking about our circumstances as well. And then the mind jogs back and forth between the two. So this is a story of a man no one will see as a hero. He's self-centered, bombastic, greedy, and sentimental. He lacks initiative. He lacks imagination. He's a follower, not a leader. And the question that drives the book is how does this man end up as one of fascist Italy's most important political figures, leader of the Black Shirts, colonial governor, minister for African empire? And I think the skill of the book is uh, lies in the deliberation, but also the subtlety with which Vicky poses and then answers that question. Throughout, she keeps showing us not just how Taruzzi made history, and he did make history, though only as a tool of something else, but also how history made Taruzzi. So we see a post-war moment mm -hmm. Uh, that kind of declined to give him the kind of honor and sexual access that he thought was his due, and that that catapulted him into the fascist movement. And we see how a dearth of talent there enables his rise. Mm -hmm. um, and we see how Italy's rapid acquisition of a colonial empire allows him to indulge equally in his sexual appetites and his appetite for marching around. And on page 283, and I just want to quote one point, Vicky makes this point explicitly. Taruzzi's personal life choices were being made in perfect synchronicity with the historical moment. So there's a kind of elective affinity between the man and his times and between the story of fascism and the story of his life. And that makes the life matter to us. We want to know how does a man like this come to hold such important posts? And I at least wanted to know too, and I think Vicky did as well, why he had more success than he really ought to have had in his private life too. 
It's hard to understand why, why, why Liliana Weinman agrees to marry this horrible man, but there's something about fascism at the moment. It's shininess, it's sexiness, it's oversized character, it's bombast, and her own excessive personality, of course, that makes this possible. So a good chunk of the book is devoted to the ca catastrophic course of that marriage and to Teruzzi's attempt to have it annulled and to the endless Bleak House-like court case that follows. Once again, that case is eerily reflective of the time. Mm. Teruzzi picks up one charge after another to fling at Liliana, each in its way reflective of the regime's character. Sexual incontinence, this from a man prone to pick up underage prostitutes, a late descent into sheer anti-Semitic rage. But it doesn't quite work. And I found that one of the great pleasures of the book is the way Vicky uses the court case to show not just fascism's excesses, but also its limits. And here I think I'm recapitulating something that Alexander Still has said. Liliana is American, rich, well-connected, egotistical, canny, and in many ways out of Teruzzi's league. And she uses every one of her advantages. Teruzzi can't send her to a remote detention camp as he does to the woman who takes up he takes up with after her, who's the mo mother of his beloved daughter. And I really found this episode the most shocking in the book. Liliana's different. She's prouder, but she's also much, much more resourceful. And after the marriage breaks down, she doesn't want to live with this dreadful man, but she does want to clear her name. So she refuses to agree to an annulment. She doesn't want him around, but she does want him punished. And she wins. She wins in that the court case takes forever, winding its way through this, this and that, extension and adjournment, four years, five years, six years, seven years. So Teruzzi can't marry his new partner, can't fully protect his daughter. She's back in New York by this point, and Teruzzi's at war, but things are still dragging along. And Liliana wins, I think, not only by delay, but also, and this is really important for the historians, and it's where Vicky ends the book, in a sense, and indeed for all of us, Liliana wins because she forces this seemingly private story, the story of fascism's enabling of a particular sort of egregious entitlement into the record. At the end, Vicky tells us we would have never known Teruzzi's character or about how this sort of man could flourish at this time had Liliana, for reasons of her own, not forced the production of so many official documents which leads me to really my only real question, and it's the one about limits. And it's one, of course, I'm thinking about with real anxiety, given that we too are living under the bombastic near tyranny of a brittle male narcissist enabled by his times. This is, how was it that Teruzzi couldn't just end this torment and force a decision in his favor? Throughout this saga, the courts declined to see matters through his eyes. They usually ruled irrelevant, those documents raging about Liliana's infidelity or duplicity or Jewishness. So why couldn't a fascist hierarch bend these institutions to accept his version of the story, his alternative facts? So why did some aspect of civil society hold? Next. Thank you so much, Susan. That is a question I think we, we, we must definitely come back to because it does indeed have ominous implications. One might infer that the courts in fascist Italy were perhaps doing a better job than... I won't even complete that thought. Um, before, before we go there, Rachel, um, would you like to give us your comments too? Sure, thank you so much for having me on the panel. And Victoria, congratulations. This is really a fascinating book. And I think I join the other panelists in in celebrating it, I was really struck by the combination of, of, as you put it, the macro and the micro, and just the sweep of history through Teruzzi and Liliana Weinman and just their their characters. I I also just love some kind of unexpected turns of phrase. You know, he breaks up with her basically by telegram out of the blue, and she's in New York, and she takes a ship back, and you say, you know, I, I how how um, she'd never traveled alone before, and sitting at the captain's table was no comfort. That that just should give you a sense of of the of the real readability of this book in addition to all of the the history. I think that um you know as as Susan Peterson was saying 
Weinman manages to delay and delay and delay this request for an annulment, she has understood an essential thing about Italy, which is that, you know, time is power. That's kind of how you, how you wield a certain kind of power there. I'm struck by how you used these marital and sexual relations as a window into the fascist project, how at the outset Liliana is kind of praised for her purity, this great fascist virtue, and then somehow the tables are turned, and then to have him, the fascist, associate with a Jew was seen as, you know, she's somehow impure and that makes him weaker. You know, this is kind of an old anti-Semitic trope in many places about, you know, Jews and outsiders as kind of feminizing and polluting, you know, the virility of, of uh, of that system. I came away with a bunch of, of, of questions and maybe I'll, I'll just kind of pivot to, to those. I mean, one is really, I'm struck by, Teruzzi has, he just, he's with one Jewish woman after another. I mean, even after the Romanian one who he sends to, you know, the, to, to, to Lipari, he finds a Spanish Jewish phalangist, which must have taken some doing. And I kind of wonder what motivated that, whether it was a kind of rebelliousness against the very regime he was promoting, or if you could elaborate a little bit more on just what the unique psychology of, of, of him is that, that kind of makes that bond such a, you know, essential part of, um, part of his life. I mean, does it show fascism's kind of flexibility or is it a, just a personal failing? Which also brings me to, you know, another of the big questions that those of us who've been studying and living in and wrestling with Italy for so many years have, which is the great question of Italy as outlier or Italy as harbinger. Like, where is it just this strangely deviant place and where does it actually connect, I think, to some of the, the dynamics um, in, in Europe at this time. I mean, maybe if you could kind of extrapolate a little bit about um, what makes this fascist marriage and alliance unique. I mean, aside from the huge role of the Catholic Church, which as Sandra points out is fundamental to this in ways that, you know, it might not have been in other countries. I just wonder, you know, how much, um, you know, we can extrapolate from this. And I think also, there is, you know, the question of, I guess, the, the, the echoes today of this idea of like Dio, Patria, Familia, God, Fatherland, and Family, which is such a, you know, a pillar of the, of the fascist project, and whether, you know, how, how much people believed in that, but then they kind of didn't believe in that, and whether the kind of, um, you know, deviation from that norm it becomes also part of the of the project. I guess what the other the one writer who I think of who's done kind of work of a different kind in this terrain of how fascism gets inside you know human relationships is Alberto Moravia, with whom I've been having you know an argument for many years now because he kind of gets at this like weak and self loathing you know men in, in under under fascism, and I don't think Teruzzi seems weak or self-loathing if on the contrary but I, I i thought of moravia sometimes in reading this book as as an author who kind of explored that connection as you do somehow between you know the personal marital sexual dynamics and then the you know the larger political project of the nation i will kind of wrap it up there but i also wonder if you might project forward into the future and into contemporary italy about how you think what we, you know, have have learned from this really important and, and impressive book about, you know, the legacy of this in contemporary Italy today. I've done a fair amount of of reporting over the years about, you know, the rise of, of right wing parties today. We have the, you know, the Lega, the the the, the League, and it, you know, purports to be all in favor of these values. And then in the end, it's kind of unclear if it believes in anything besides its um, its own will to power, which is another, you know, lingering Italian question. But on the whole, uh, I, I think that this was a very impressive book, and I learned a tremendous amount from it. And I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Rachel. 
Vicky, I, I think it would be great if you would if you would respond to some of those comments yes. uh, before we go out. Um, so I, I think the first one I wanted to address was Rachel's que uh, question about how I regarded Italy um, uh, in, in some ways, its position in the world, uh, and then w w what the reflections are in terms of uh, you know, Teruzzi's character, his role, and then as Susan uh, Peterson said, be, you know, be made over, responding, be made by making uh, his, his position. So I, but more and more I thought of Italy, I like to think of Italy as a regular country. So yes, it's got lots of opera and there's lots of popular melodrama which fed into the opera and then back and forth in Milan, rational, Commercial Milan is the center of that melodramatic, you know, world. Uh, differently, I'm sure you'd find it in Naples uh, and, and maybe other places as well. But so it, there is uh, Italy, I see coming out of World War I, but even going into it is a rising power. Uh, but it is caught between these worlds, the world of uh, old declining Great Britain, where it wants the Mediterranean, the U.S., which admires hugely and has all sorts of ties to, including immigrants and, and capital, and the, the the fact of Mussolini coming to power can't go here why is very important because this man, very modern man, a very smart journalist, a huge amount of political experience from the socialist movement, a a, a brilliant publisher, the rhetorics of his newspaper are extremely strong. You know, he knows how to use the media. He knows how to use this uh, piazza. He doesn't know how to ar uh, organize squads. But then he gets Teruzzi involved. And that's, that's interesting. He's not a military man. He's violent, but not a military man. So what I'm seeing here is Italy in some sense as an, a vanguard in this transformation. It organizes a movement. It's very aware of how it looks. It's very interested in putting forward these new men. Teruzzi goes to Stresa. He looks good. These guys look good in uniform. They laugh about the British being decrepit, the French being sterile. They're very uncertain about the Germans, and they really don't even get to know the Germans until the second half of the 1930s, when Hitler, who Mussolini mocks unmercifully in 1933, 1934, has becoming, becoming more and more of an important figure, and Italy is going to fold under it, just as it would Gosh, gosh knows in the European Union, it's going to come in under this enormous German uh, capacity to change the world. So I'd like to think of Italy as sort of the, the vanguard of fa a global fascism. And that I mean, brings us to Teruzzi. So Teruzzi has this advantage. He's from Milan, so part of this commercial culture. He is from the rising class, which is not going anywhere. Colonial army, Eritrea, then, which is means part of the world. You know, they, they, they see the French at work, they see the British. So uh, he's, he's cosmopolitan. He's first met Jews, and this comes now to Rachel's question, in, uh, uh, in, 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 I'm sorry, in Libya, okay? And then at Darna, where there's a large J mixed Jewish com community, very cosmopolitan. The Italians can't go with the Arab women, but they certainly love the <laughs> Jewish women who are not veiled, but look like Arabs and so on and so forth, and who are out, out, out and around. So that there was an interest in, in Jewish women as part of this cosmopolitan Mediterranean is, is not surprising. Uh, now, that means that Teruzzi, in some ways, rough as he is, uh, does have, is, wants to be debonair. Okay? He's got this military training, which has certain prestige. He's not an intellectual, but his family has uh, people who have striven and risen. His sister, okay, who has gone, is, is, is gone to um, school. And that was very important, very telling for, for me when I discovered that the sister, older sister, uh, who adored him, had uh, gone to school, and also his first cousin, who was uh, leading the uh, 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 neuropsychiatrist globally in, in, in Europe and wide in the 1920s. So it's a funny, you know, this is a petty bourgeois family that's making its way, and, and, and so there is in him other things besides his thug. For the, for the Jewish thing, who are cosmopolitan women? In, the, in Liliana's case, a big woman likes big women. His mother's a big woman, I presume. You can't, it's hard to know. The second woman, too, cosmopolitan. She's come from Romania, um, from 
Cairo. He's interested very much in the, uh, the, the, the Levant and the Orient. She's at Turin. Her, she comes from a, the Romanian consul. She's a woman alone. She's smart. She's full of capacity. So that's the, 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 that's the third, because there was one at Darna. The, 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 the phalangists, that was what they called her. They, they, the people who didn't understand who she was said he brought her back from, from uh, uh, Spain, and she was Spanish phalangist. That was part of the kind of crazy, craziness. So I asked again and again, is this guy the thing for Jewish woman? You know, is this, is this some sort of macabre? Uh, you no, know, I decided it was really a social type. Uh, different as they were, uh, and that there was something about, he found it protective to have a woman outside and not being shared by all of these fascists, and basically who was inaccessible to them because of their loyalty to him and their outsider status and so on and so forth. I think that, if you want, is part of this character of this older, older man. The church's role, gosh, it's, it, you know, this, it's never ending. The church is forever, What's fascism? <laughs> 25 years. And that's how the, the church operates. Church law is immense. Um, under fascism, there are probably many churches, but two in particular. There's the Vatican in Rome, and there's the Church of Milan, which, when you get into it, has its own history, its immense hierarchy, its uh, quasi-Protestant qualities, and it's very ambivalent about the Jewish question, especially if it's being, the Jews are being discussed by these loathsome uh, hack uh, ideologues who, who happen to be running the fascists uh, in the Lombard area. So that politics of the church is very complicated and it's hard to reduce it to one, to the Pope, uh, and which has always then created a lot of problems on how to interpret then the church's response uh, to the, the Jewish question. That's why it's still open for debate. So Liliana works this and she gets the most amazing lawyers who are against the fascists and for the church. This in Milan, the founder of the Catholic Party is her lawyer, the founder of the Italian founder of the League of Nations is her civil lawyer in the first round. Um, she will be able to get these people around them and the shift in the papacy in the late 20th, um, 1930s, I so, don't want to get it too much into this, everybody will go crazy, it, may, it plays the major role. So they are, she is, Teruzzi is able to slam it through on the second level. But this church law and this church process is so complicated that it keeps being appealed and appealed and appealed. It has to go to the Sacra Rota. There's this notion of moral certainty. It's got to go again and again. And by that time, it's 41 and the Vatican has sniffed that the winds are turning, and even if it, you know, no matter what it does, it cannot allow Jews to be divorced. That goes against what the Pope is saying about human life is sacred. But it's not just the Pope. You think, too, these are the judges on the Sacra Rota are very international. They come from Switzerland, they come from Belgium, they come from Britain. You know, they uh, have behind them a very different operation. And by 41, you know, it's very difficult. It, it, that seems to be it. And then Liliana gets behind her, the Archdiocese of New York. And, you know, the Pope, I mean, it's hard, this can't be documented, but the Archdiocese of New York is very active in showing her how to proceed. So, you know, what letters to write and so on. Part of their mandate is to support a, a defendant, but clearly, and she takes advantage of it. So I guess I wasn't so surprised in the end, given how annulments operate. Um, it does show that certainly by 39, the, the regime in terms of the church is losing its mojo. It's having a hard time influencing it in terms of certain kinds of moral questions where you know, the God uh, you know, is defending civil society from more and more clearly from the gross interference of Mussolini, who before that had ceded that whole terrain to the church. So that, yeah. in, in, uh, not a nutshell, but all over the place, <laughs> the, the first answers to some of your questions. I suggest a rather horrifying proposition that faced with this kind of power, you need 
the complex pluralistic authority of an instance like the Catholic Church to genuinely protect something like the rule of law, which is a which is a terrifying idea. I wonder, Vicky, whether you could flesh out for us a little bit more that phase that you gestured that you might fill out for us a little bit more with Q and A. The moment when he becomes a fascist, how he becomes a fascist, the transition from his conventional wartime career, mediocre conventional, to this very rapid ascent up this hierarchy. Um, we have a lot of, of course, familiar stories about how men, how men of his type in Italy become fascist. Is, it, is, it, is he different in any way or does he really rather more epitomize that kind of familiar story? Well, the, what's specific about him is that he's, um, he's cagey, opportunistic and, and cautious. Okay. He's calcul he calculates. Uh, and so coming back, seeing Italy a total mess, seeing that the workers in his neighborhood are, are striking, uh, seeing the rudeness to the officers, and they do take it as the most terrible insult, to have their uniforms insulted. That's the uniform of the king. And, it's hard. and, and so if it's not to them personally, it's you're insulting an officer of the king, which in the past you know, had a kind of legality. There was a legal question about assaulting an officer of the king in uniform. Um, so that he's very caught up by, by that. He has to go into the reserves. He's not gonna become uh, a colonel. Uh, that's, there's no hope of that. So he's resigned to leaving the uh, to the military. He's thinking of that. And he's inter he's part of Milan, you know these little guys. He's been coming. He's been seen around the gallery for since 1913. You know, he's he, people know him because he's you know, a handsome soldier, blue uh, with a blue uniform, not not a khaki because the colonial uh, uniform is is blue with his beard. And, you know, and so he's introduced to Mussolini by a, a journalist friend, and immediately calculates that, and then. The moment he joins, as I figured it out, is exactly when everything swings. That is, the socialists win again in Milan. There's this electoral terror in which the socialists seem to be winning. And at that point, many bourgeois conservatives shift over to tr saying, hmm, we see this, these men possibly as men of order. And then the terrorist attacks in Milan he's able to play that with, by organizing this extraordinary funeral. So his going up is, uh, I think as Susan suggested, this capa his capacity as, a, as an organizer of squads. Uh, he's a strict disciplinarian. They're not gonna you know, run around and beat socialists up anymore because then they get beaten up. It's, it's to bring a military discipline to the squads to create a home army, uh, which uh, will work with the army, which will work with the prefecture is the questura. So that's his idea. And he has the connections to make, start making that, that work because he's a hometown boy. So in retrospect, it doesn't seem surprising. Clearly others found other ways of doing it and did not join. And that has to do again with this impetuous character. The fact they loved his freedom in the colonies where he was he, he, he was the head of Darna, a community of 5,000. He was a battalion, battalion commander, a major. So he was used to commanding. And this particular situation, there weren't, there weren't majors in the fascist movement. That, that was the highest lev level, unless they recruited actually a general, which they did one. So, you know, he, 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 he could see that. And then the problem was, for him, what, what it's to curb any kind of indiscipline because he saw that party faction fighting was really terrifying. So he becomes a, a kind of commissar, anti-literum within the movement, you know, the person who's gonna bash heads if fascists fight amongst themselves, and especially if they involve, get involved in duels. So it's a, you know, he's a man of order, and this is the other face who is always provoking disorder. So once more, the fascists can say, we are men of order. And that, 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 the brilliance of Taruzzi is he stands out always, all the way down to the very end when he, uh, Mussolini flees and then it's gonna be captured and killed by the partisans. Taruzzi mobilizes his own <coughs> brigade of 
black shirts and he with 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 a tank and you know, it doesn't work out but he is ready for and engages in the in a final shootout mm -hmm. uh, he's he's in the 60s and he's got his wife and daughter with him so this is a man who you know doesn't change in that sense well, I have a question from the floor. I'm going to do my best to ventriloquize some of these. It's from Michaela Payero. Um, it's rather an abstract question, but I think it takes us to uh, the issue of sexuality and, it, and the role that you see for that theme in the historiography of fascism. So the question is, would you suggest that sexuality and governmentality, the Foucauldian term, are indeed keys to define fascism? Would you suggest that the particular nature of sexuality and gender in the colony on the one side and Taruzzi's alleged homosexual affairs with Ascari on the other are somehow intertwined? Gosh. So I guess a, a sort of a blank canvas for you to explore. But I have this. been very um, struck, again, fascism in this leadership role. Everybody, you know, all governments coming out of World War I, they're so worried about population and deaths and young men dying and what that means. They're very worried about the population question and sort of everybody in that period becomes eugenicist as they think about what the state should do and what it should not. But again, here Mussolini is a leader there that the question gets politicized very quickly by 1924. They're engaged in battles for births. And because of that contempt and that violence that they're gonna treat, Women, uh, you know, breed, men, studs, <laughs> you know, it becomes a kind of a harshness, uh, uh, I think a moral harshness and a political harshness too about you know, who, whose socialists are impotent and that's why they've been knocked off. Uh, later they'll talk about the British that way, the Arabs are dirty and sneaky. There's a kind of a, you know, naming of men uh, in that way. But I, I think then you see it cumulatively Again, the race laws are not until 1938. And so you know, you're, you're, you're moving from a European until the moment that the fascists begin to have to really uh, operate these colonies. And then the problem of the colonial peoples, subjects and how they're related then to the Jews. And by then, you know, Hitler, the you know, race laws being formulated, not that Mussolini's uh, meeting, uh, uh, copying them. But I, I think that, you know, the, the trajectory, the, the Italians are at the foreground in the population policies. Uh, and then by the 1930s, you know, Hitler is moving ahead and this fascist spoke about this, you know, the, the Nuremberg laws, he was very distressed about that idea that this was getting such, making such clamor. And, you know, the Italians still try to keep their leadership. And the way they do it is an ironic way by saying we do not believe in positive eugenics. We only believe in negative, you know, love children are great. Okay. Sterilizing people, that's, that's the dirty, positivistic Nazi way as if people were pigs. And we know that, that you don't breed better people. You breed better people by having free love, by, you know, marrying and having several children and so on and so forth. So you know, the, the, the ca ca fascists probably always keep ahead and you would see it I'm sure in Latin America where uh, the fascist population politics were very widely studied uh, because they were had become by the late 1930s extremely rich so uh, to that abstract question I'd say I don't think we need the, the Foucault though I like you know the idea of biopolitics was already a word that was used I like the idea of how you use the powers of government to govern bodies I think that that's important you yeah. know and that, yeah, we um, we have a question here, which and I, I can't, can't in my own head quite resolve where you stand on this. And I, I, I've, I've read only the preface, which I thought was just magical this afternoon. And that's as far as I've got. So but the, the question is from uh, Daniel Atraldi, and he says, as scholars, shall we look into other histories of fascist nobodies from Europe and beyond? I couldn't quite decide whether you thought this guy was an nobody because he's a very high-ranking nobody if he's a nobody yeah. uh, i couldn't help also of course you know the, the, i think i think the question is rather should we go back and restudy fascism i totally think we should my when i studied fascism in the 60s it was still deeply part of, uh, of it was still current history 
uh, for, for most of us. We were studying with German Jewish professors. The, the work was still very fresh on fascism. We had marvelous classic works. And then from the 70s on, people stopped studying fascism. Now there's a resurgence, there's been this resurgence, a lot of typologies, churning, churning, churning. And in Columbia, we read Hannah Arendt, The Origins of Totalitarianism, which was written in 1949, 50, with all kinds of, and she kept saying, you know, Italy is not really there because it didn't put the Nazi and so on. So it's very timely to reread some of the classics, some extraordinary ones, by this dual state disorder order uh, uh, on the law corruption of the law. Uh, and so I guess it's not the, the nobody. We don't need to look at the men. There are many other projects one could look at uh, to, um, to, to get where we want to go. I mean, there are a lot of women. <laughs> I mean, there's many other things one can do to get behind our, our in some sense, we haven't yet come back to really gripping that trajectory, that parabola of authoritarianism, 45. And now you have another parabola, which I say we can't call fascist because that will create such confusion and be so reductive and has no predictive value. So going back to the original, that's what historians do, to try to understand this very central place in it, very sensitive country. country, cosmopolitan, Catholic church right inside of it. You know, very differences between North and South. Once more, where's the far right comes from? <laughs> so there are, some of these figures are very similar uh, to, 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 to the past. With the worry too, of course, just to, and that, you know, I can imagine, you know, Portaruzzi, let's call it that way. In Italian, you say Portaruzzi, even if he's the most monstrous person in the world. Uh, you know, he doesn't have a gravestone. Uh, and I can't imagine that, you know, Verrano, that neo-fascists won't start putting flowers on his, his, little, uh, uh, his little grave. <laughs> Just, you know, that, that there will be a discovery of him, uh, part of a whole revival of a fascist cultural tradition. I fear that uh, we may be having a slight Wi-Fi problem with sound coming in and out. I hope it's uh, I hope it's not too serious. But, uh, but before we wrap up, several people in the several people in the chat have said to me, "Can you go back to Susan's question? Um, why, as it were, was the legal system in the end an impediment to him being able to obtain his will?" I, I took you actually to answer that, but yeah, but, but yeah. clearly, folks in the chat feel that we need to go back to it. So my reading was that you were explaining to us just how complex the Catholic legal system was, how many opportunities for resistance it provided, and the fact that they were in some sense, in fact, external to the power structure of fascism, which is of course true. And as the balance of power shifts after 1939, as it were, so the politics of that court shift. Is that, did I, did I get that? Did I get that right? I thought that was your answer to Susan's question. It, it, it is. I think that legal question for legal historians is is very interesting. That the uh, I, I think it's politically contingent. So there are three rulings. The first refuses to grant the annulment, thirty five, uh, and there's shock that. Uh, an anti-Jewish libel was used, and this is still Pius the Eleventh. Then Pius the Eleventh dies, and there's a new trial, which had started before, which the church is divided by. And at that point, they shove through, they force, I think, the uh, the, ju the jury at Pavia, which is part of the Archdiocese of Milan, to grant the. Uh, 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 annulment on the grounds that um, uh, this Liliana Weinman, being a Jew and American, did not believe in the sacred nature of marriage. Fascinating and very uh, legally impoverished argument. Okay. In other words, that uh, 
she had gone into the marriage believing it could be dissolved. That's why how the Kennedys have gotten their divorces by saying, you know, somebody's Protestant or whatever, or they didn't believe that there were, that's now become a very commonly argued thing that the culture is uh, that, not, not Jewish, goodness gracious, but in a country with Protestantism, somebody could have had a second thought about it. So that was the argument that was used, uh, that, that she was Jewish and American, uh, and, and therefore uh, could be trusted to give a you know, proper um, d d defense in any case. And, uh, but above all, from, from countries and cultures that admitted to divorce. Now, it looks to me that um, this was from chewing and throwing and it came out of the Vatican, no question about it, that pressure, because her, her, her lawyer was Pope's nephew, <laughs> I mean, the Pacelli. So, you know, there was a lot of, Coming, the man had a lot of power, the, 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 this Pacelli nephew. But then by the time it went back, it had to go to the third level, which is the sacred rota, uh, which, which is the rota. And um, that, at that point, it clearly bogs down in procedure, but also my sense is the jurists could not accept that kind of logic. The Pope was specifically against any notion that you could break up a marriage because the wife or the husband was Jewish. They, in, in, in Germany, that wasn't allowed. You know, you did other, you had a civil divorce, but a Catholic marriage couldn't have ever been uh, uh, dissolved by the church in Germany. You know, the, the, there's no record of anything like that happening. So I, I, I think the, the legal process is very complicated uh, in the church and the time change is very important uh, and in the very end. Uh, he did expect it to get it and it looks like it just got moved out and by 1941 the Vatican is taking its distance uh, from the Vatican, that is the Sacra Rota, part of the Vatican. So the church legal structure is very complicated and that annulments take place, each one differently, <laughs> usually because there's a lot of uh, interference. There were re relatively few in that period. Um, I had a, a, a Jesuit colleague expert um, look over what I did, difficult. He said, you know, a lot of my errors were just ignorance and the others were malicious, <laughs> but we corrected a lot of stuff because it's so hard to understand a secret process where you don't have a lot of cases to, to study, even though some, some, some great historical work has, has been done by professors at Notre Dame. Okay. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much, Vicky, for clarifying that. I think we can, we can all see that this is really a fascinating and indispensable book. Um, it's been brilliant to start the discussion this evening. Um, we had over 200 people here earlier. We would never have been able to find a room in real life Columbia to fit everyone in. So at least we had the, the pleasure of really celebrating and showing the enthusiasm that's going to be for this. Do check out the, the special offer from Book Culture, uh, a local business that really needs our support and I know is dear to the hearts of uh, particularly Susan and Vicky on this call. Uh, so please, please go there. The, the, for me, always the worst thing about the Zoom meetings is the ending. Um, there is something abrupt, unceremonious and just somehow wrong about the ending. The getting together, the glorious pictures of dozens, indeed hundreds of faces that we had is, is rather wonderful. Um, but the ending is just miserable and it's a shame and it would be lovely to wander out into the foyer of the Maison Francaise or somewhere like that in, in Colombia and to share a glass of wine and to spill out into a New York fall evening. We've been hearing the sirens wailing in the background uh, past several of our apartments. Uh, we can't do that and we can't even really give you, the, you and the panelists the round of applause that you deserve for a, a, a wonderful discussion, but thank you so much. And uh, uh, next year, under better circumstances, uh, we will get together again. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I'm just going to click us all off and it's all going to be gone. Um, but thank a bientôt. You. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Good night. Good night.